Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Connexus's part two of its webinar series, Are You Ready for October 1, 2020? This is the second part to uh, what was presented last Thursday at this time. I would encourage you, if you did not have a chance to see that, uh, to uh, go up to the Connexus website and download the PDF, uh, or in a couple of weeks, download the actual recording of that uh, session, where we covered some, some very important economics around, uh, around EMB. My name is Gray Taylor. I'm executive director of Connexus. Today we'll focus on the practical considerations for implementing outdoor EMV. But first we want to do a little housekeeping, Russ. So on housekeeping, this webinar is being uh, recorded and will be made available in about seven days. Um, you'll be able to download it from YouTube uh, or the uh, connexus.org website. Uh, the slide deck, uh, you'll have a, an ability to download the PDF uh, once you've filled out the survey link that will be provided at the end of the, uh, the PowerPoint. Participants, uh, please ask questions via the webinar interface um, and no specific vendor uh, questions. Um, we have provided um, all three major vendors contact information so that if you have a, um, if you do have a, a vendor specific uh, question, you can feel free to um, uh, contact them directly. Okay, so on presenters, um, tonight, today I've already introduced myself. I'm Gray Taylor, Executive Director, but we've got three really, really knowledgeable speakers about the EMB equipment side of the business and what we need to do to, to achieve compliance. Um, Dan Harrell, who's CIO and CSO of Invenco, Dan Whitkemper, Director of North American Payments at Gil Barco, and Russ Haker, who's EMB Business Leader at Dover Fueling Solutions. And let me talk a little bit about Connexus. Uh, Connexus is an independent, nonprofit, member-driven technology organization. We set standards, uh, data exchange, uh, moving now into APIs. Uh, we also spend a lot of time on translating uh, broad-based security best practices and requirements to our industry. And we're really focusing on digital and mobile commerce as it emerges as a frictionless retail uh, methodology. We provide a lot of vision into the future, and we take a look at a lot of new technologies that are coming out and try to winnow those down that, that have some, some good promise for our industry to adopt and bring them to the industry. Lastly, we advocate for our industry. Um, technology is increasingly uh, policy, and we spend a lot of time with organizations such as the World Wide Web Consortium, EMVCO, uh, U.S. Faster Payments, U.S. Payments, um, as well as uh, X9 to make sure that the, our industry's needs and uh, are represented to those external organizations and that we establish and, and maintain level playing fields when it comes to technology integrations. Next. We are coming to a close of 2020. Um, this is our last webinar of the year, but we do have one scheduled uh, for January 23rd, 2020, how to elevate your business through digital transformation. That's a hot topic that we've been talking about for the last uh, year or two, and we're now starting to see some of the uh, digital transformation methodologies uh, coming into our marketplace from adjacent uh, uh, markets. Uh, also want to talk to you about the 2020 Connexus Annual Conference, April 26th through the 30th. Uh, it's at the beautiful Lowe's of Antana Canyon in Tucson, Arizona. This is a great opportunity for you to get together with a lot of your peers in the industry and uh, learn a lot about digital transformation learn a lot about how we're going to uh, we're going to be re-architecting our tech stack through microservices uh, and also get the a chance to, to work on some some really good standards work that we're doing to move the industry forward so I, I i would invite you to consider putting that on your agenda so um let's get to the topic emv represents the best example of our industry's technology debt and if you're not familiar with that term that technology debt is um, that technology investment that lurks unreported on our financials, but it has to be made in order to remain competitive, usually because there's some disruptive event. The known disruption that we're going to be talking about today that's going to cause us to realize some technology debt is the estimated $400 million in additional liability that will shift to fuels retailers starting this October. When spread across 2018, uh, gallons sold, that equals a little bit more than a quarter of a penny per gallon in additional liability. But here's the, the, the key point to remember. If you're one of the last 25% of the industry that doesn't, that is adopting EMV, you're the, the last man standing, that cost can quickly escalate to over a penny per gallon. 
and create a, a big disadvantage with your marketing against your competitors who have. And so I want to get into the programming, and we're going to start off with Russ. Russ, why don't you take it away? Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, just to kind of highlight a few takeaways that um, I hope you guys walk out of here with today, just top-level ideas. Uh, EMV is really going to change how you guys do your operate your business going forward. Similar to PCI, uh, EMV has a set of ever-evolving uh, standards that uh, are going to change over time um, that's going to drive changes in software, kernels, potentially hardware. Uh, so this first round of EMV implementation is not going to be the last. Uh, these the standards are usually coming around on a seven-year cycle, and other markets like Asia-Pacific, for example, which implemented EMV years ago, is now on their third cycle of standards. So that's just something to keep in mind as, as we move forward. This is not a one and done sort of a business change for the industry. Uh, secondly, a, a big misnomer I hear in the market is that EMV is somehow connected to encryption, uh, which is more of a point to point functionality. EMV is really about fraud prevention and cost avoidance. It's about ensuring your business against chargebacks uh, that come from um, you know, credit card fraud, uh, from prone card type activity. Uh, the last point I, I hope you guys walk out of here today is an understanding that waiting to upgrade the EMV um, may have some undesired uh, results and consequences associated with it. I know a lot of the market is sitting on the fence trying to decide what they want to do and when they're going to do it. Uh, but right now, you know, as we get, we're, we're going to face a bottleneck. And as we get closer to uh, uh, the deadline, the longer you wait, uh, there may be some undesired side effects with that. Just let's talk about the market uh, in general as we see it as, as a group of equipment suppliers here today. I won't hit on all these points. It's just kind of a hot mess, which is it coincides with the actual state of what's happening with EMV. I think most important to mention is that the outdoor liability shift is going to happen next October. Um, there was an article published by Max just a few days ago, as a matter of fact, in which they were talking Visa and MasterCard. Uh, and Visa and MasterCard both uh, put in writing um, in response to some industry requests that the liability shift is not going to move. Uh, so for those of you that are still holding on to that hope, uh, I wouldn't place any money on that um, for next October. Um, we're seeing a lot of large retailers move um, in the market and, you know, grocery store chains, these types of hypermarket businesses, uh, those businesses that have a large brand and a large footprint to protect. Uh, but the majority of the market is made up of single site owners, and that's where we're seeing a lot of, you know, the wait and see kind of mindset. Um, a lot of the, the feedback is around the notion that the risk is not justified by the cost of the upgrade. Um, so hopefully we can give you some insight into actually what the risks are today as well. Uh, in terms of where we are in terms of upgrades in the industry, I think we're around 35% uh, hardware installed. That does not mean that all of those sites that have hardware are actually processing EMV transactions. Uh, the hardware is just there. So we've got quite a bit of ways to go. And as mentioned uh, before, one of the undesired consequences, uh, the longer uh, you may you choose to wait as a merchant, there's an ASO tech deficit in the market. Uh, if everybody released their, uh, decided they were going to upgrade tomorrow and release their orders, there's just not enough time between now and October uh, 1st, not enough technicians to complete the work. So that's going to have some negative impact as we move forward. Let's talk a little bit more about fraud at the dispenser. This is a little bit of a, pardon me, a rehash of what was talked about last week. Um, overall, the entire industry from in terms of an outdoor payment uh, scenario is seeing around $400 million in outdoor credit card fraud. I think uh, uh, Max and Connexus estimate that um, in 2020, that number is going to approach $450 million. And, you know, these days, the Secret Service being one of the primary agencies that combats this kind of fraud, they say they're recovering roughly 30 to skimmers a week. Uh, and as Visa talked about last week, when the indoor transition occurred, that really opened up the forecourt uh, towards for this type of fraud activity. And that's where a lot of criminal organizations are focusing their efforts. So what does this look like in terms of an individual sort of transaction? Uh, let's say an individual who has already got a set of clone cards, white cards, um, ready to use on your site, wants to come to your site and, um, and use those clone cards. And they say they've got a retrofitted van or truck that's capable of, uh, you know, holding several hundred gallons of fuel that they're driving around to various stations and using these clone cards. So, you know, they're going to pump in $75 worth of diesel, uh, do a full transaction if that's a transaction limit for your site. And you as a merchant in this scenario, I mean, you're out from an opportunity cost. That's $75 of revenue. You've also lost your transaction fee, the cost of the product, because you're not getting that back to sell to somebody else. 
uh, any overhead that went into marketing or operational costs to get that transaction, that sale, you've lost that. And you've also lost the chargeback fees. So at a high level estimate, um, the total losses for these types of activities on a transaction basis to the merchant are estimated to two to three X the actual uh, price of the transaction sale. Um, so something to consider going forward. If we kind of explode that out and what that looks like in terms of real data, this is real data from Visa. Um, the names have been uh, hidden here for these stores, but these are actual sites over a 12 month period uh, looking at the uh, losses that they've incurred due, um, to, due to fraud uh, with chargebacks included. Um, something to point out here is that you know, the chargebacks are not going to be hitting these vendors uh, until about 30 to 60 days until after uh, the fraud occurs. So it may not be something that you see for a month or two until the activity is actually hit in your forecourt. Um, in addition to that, you'll notice some of these trends here. In some cases, in scenario one, it looks like the, the criminals involved may have been testing the waters a little bit in the months preceding up to you know, larger activity, whereas in the cases of three, four, and five, uh, there was pretty much no warning. And when you get down into scenarios four and five for these C stores, these, depending on your size of the business and how many sites you're operating, um, this could be business breaking uh, sort of level fraud transaction and criminal activity. Something else to point out, um, just some, some recent activity that Secret Service is actually seeing. Um, they're actually recently have seen uh, foreign crime organizations, specifically from the Ukraine, moving across the Mexican border. And they're coming across with the uh, training and the equipment to explicitly commit white card fraud. So, you know, this is a growing problem and it, it's, it's organized. And it may be only a matter of time till it hits your doorstep. Uh, in terms of what we're seeing in terms of physical a fraud and, and the types of equipment they're using to get the information to create white cards, clone cards. Um, everybody's familiar with, with typical inline MagStripe card uh, skimmers. These are typically a small PCB with a cable attached to it. Usually there's some kind of shrink wrap, as you can see in the picture around the PCB. Uh, the only way you guys can really protect yourselves from this type of uh, intrusion is to inspect the inside of your heads. That would be the, the primary thing if you don't have any other passive security systems on your dispensers. If you ever see anything like the picture on the right there with shrink wrap around the, on a cable coming out of the back of a card reader, um, that is not coming from your OEM equipment supplier. We would never put anything like that in the dispenser. Um, some other things that you could do to combat this type of activity are to upgrade your lock systems on your dispensers. Uh, both these dispenser equipment providers have um, lock scenarios where you can upgrade from the standard hex keys. We also have uh, security systems through a series of uh, sensors and software that can be used to actively monitor, monitor uh, intrusion into the electronic head. Uh, these systems typically work in the fashion that if somebody who needs to have access, like a maintenance ASO shows up, they can use a, a code that's generated uh, from one of our companies and enter that into the into the pin pad and that gives them the access to temporarily disable the system while they do their work and then the system would rearm itself uh, shortly after everything's buttoned up. But these these types of systems are something that you can add along with your EMV upgrades to help prevent unauthorized access to the electronic cabinet. Additionally, just upgrading to the EMV ready hardware that's out there right now goes a long way towards preventing those types of inline skimmers. Um, these EMV hybrid readers, these chip capable readers, uh, have hardware handshaking with the other components in the EPS system uh, that are designed to prevent uh, inline skimmers like what you saw in the previous slides from working. Uh, it'll actually send the system in, into a sort of a soft breach state uh, and won't take payment until you figure out what's going on. So these are the ways you can kind of help the industry fight um, this kind of fraud on the front end. Uh, once you've upgraded the EMV or even put your EMV hardware in, maybe you don't have the software turned on yet, some of the newer things we're seeing uh, in terms of attacks are external skimmers being mounted on the outside of the dispenser. Since uh, fraudsters can no longer put those inline skimmers in, they're trying to put something, uh, a replica of the molded face of the card reader, for example, on the front of the dispenser. And inside of those housings are maghead readers and small memory chips, maybe Bluetooth transmitters designed to pick up the card read uh, before it actually get the card actually gets into the reader. Another new technology is called a shimmer. Uh, this is actually a mylar film with similar components uh, placed on it that is inserted into the slot of the EMV reader. Uh, and the, the idea here is that again, as you insert your card, even if you're trying to do a chip read, 
uh, card that's a hybrid card with that Mac stripe in there, this shimmer would still pick up that Mac stripe information off of that card. The only real way to detect for these um, types of attacks for the external ones, you want to look for anything that's protruding from the front face of your dispenser. Um, all of the equipment providers, EMV capable readers, are flush mounted with the front of the dispenser. So if something is protruding in front of it, like that photo with the blue dispenser on the left, that's most likely something that doesn't belong there. In terms of the shimmers that are going inside the card slots, the only way to really detect these is with the use of a flashlight and visual inspection and to listen to cues from your customers. If you've got a lot of customers coming in saying, hey, I'm having problems, problems on pump one, it's really hard to get my card in and out of the slot, you might have something in there that shouldn't be there. Um, so that's kind of the end of my section. I'm going to hand it over to Dan Harrell now. He's going to talk a little bit about EMV enablement and how to get from point A to point B in terms of EMV readiness. Thanks, Russ. So Russ has covered uh, some of the reasons that we need to be looking at EMV enablement uh, and did a good job of showing us what types of things we need to look out for. I'm gonna focus on the process that you're gonna need to go through uh, in order to make this EMV conversion at your retail locations. So there's really these six steps in enabling your EMV forecourt. The first is really to do a site survey and understand what equipment that you have in place today. This is essential so that you get the right kits and or equipment uh, that's necessary in order to make this conversion. Once you understand what you have at your retail locations, you're gonna be looking at whether you want to replace the pumps that are already there or look at EMV retrofit kits that are available for your dispensers that basically give you that EMV card reading capabilities. Now, some of these options will have contactless in them already, but if they don't, you might want to consider adding a contactless reader uh, so that you can enable those tap and pay type situations or whether it's Apple Pay or Google Pay, Samsung Pay, those new payment options which allow a customer a very seamless experience for paying with EMV uh, and getting their fuel. As a part of this process, you'll also be converting your forecourt, uh, basically extending your store network out to those fuel pumps. So you'll be needing to TCP IP enable those forecourts with a variety of solutions that are available in the market today, most of which don't require you to replace the wiring that you have in the ground. Once you've got the forecourt equipment in place, you're gonna most likely need to do a software upgrade to either your POS or EPS system. Um, this is basically to enable the data on those chip cards to be properly processed uh, by your uh, payment host. And finally, it's to make that change at the EMV payment host so that your retail location is now processing chip cards with all of the outdoor transactions. Now there's really three ways uh, beyond these six steps by which you can do this implementation. And each of these has different ramifications in terms of cost and timing of the implementation. Uh, a dual trip approach means that you would be going out to the location and upgrading your forecourt with EMV capable equipment. That EMV capable equipment uh, would be running in MagStripe mode up until the point at which you upgrade the systems inside your store and your payment processor to process those EMV payments. Now that's basically uh, could, could be done in steps or opportunities one and two here. The first of which is we would actually send somebody to the site to perform that POS upgrade and to work with the processor to make that migration. In the single trip where it's POS activated, this basically means you've run the site in MagStripe mode and then remotely upgraded the POS and remotely worked with the processor to convert to the actual EMB processing of outdoor transactions. And the last of these opportunities for doing so, the single trip Big Bang, means that all of your uh, equipment and your POS upgrade and your processing uh, are all ready to be done in a single trip. Um, this could have some significant logistical and synchronization challenges because you need to make sure that everybody's ready to do that switch at any given point in time, uh, but also could be more cost-effective because you can limit it down to a single trip. 
Next slide. So I've mentioned this before, but this does involve upgrading uh, your forecourt to be TCP IP enabled. This does have some security ramifications uh, that you need to be aware of. In addition to that, most of these devices uh, have cloud connectivity options, which, which is uh, good for retailers for a number of reasons. But all of these have different security ramifications. So you can either work through your IT organization to make sure that your sites have the proper uh, connectivity and security in place, or you can work with third-party managed network service providers who can take care of this security for you. But making this investment in the TCP IP uh, enabled forecourt uh, basically puts you in a good situation to be efficient in the future. Uh, because with EMV, you're likely to have to upgrade your payment terminals and software over the lifetime of that terminal. And some of the enhanced capabilities like remote diagnostics and remote monitoring of the equipment are enabled through this TCP IP enablement. So I'm gonna turn over the presentation now to Dan Whitkemper who's going to talk a little bit about more of the other ramifications of EMV. Great. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, so this is Dan Whitkemper with Gabarco. And uh, so Russ walked us through some of the fraud risk elements. And Dan just explained the steps to enable four-court EMV. And the piece I'm going to share with you today is more around the lessons that we've learned along the way. Specifically here, let's talk about uh, considerations around uh, permitting especially speaking to those folks in California. Uh, permits can take a couple weeks up to a year, depending on the type of uh, uh, EMV upgrade that's occurring at your site and what, what's being upgraded and if there's any groundbreaking that has to occur. So it is very scope dependent. We're also hearing in other states, there could be similar ramifications as well. So please work with your local authorized service contractor. They would have a better sense of the type of permits that would be needed for the specific type of EMV upgrade that you would in encounter. Um, Russ, we can go to the next slide. The next item here we wanna talk through is around waiting. So what we've done is we've looked back at some data, uh, a fair amount of data that uh, for projects that we've managed over the last uh, 12 years or so. Going back to the PCI uh, upgrade cycle from 2008 and 9, and the more recent indoor EMV upgrade cycle. And we took a look at what was the cost to manage a program to upgrade a site um, with specific timing in mind. For example, here, uh, what we've seen was running up to a particular um, deadline, the cost went up by 14% six months out from that deadline. When you were three months out from that deadline, it went up, to, up by 23%. And at the end of the deadline, or sorry, at the deadline rather, it went up by 33%. And even right afterwards, three months later, it was still hovering at like a 31% increase over what we'd say was our normal costs. And you might ask, well, what drives that? And Russ kind of touched on it a bit. I mean, there's a, a, a fixed number of resources in the field that can do these upgrades. So what we end up encountering is overtime hours. So as you get closer to that deadline date and more retailers uh, make requests of the ASCs to uh, come out and do these upgrades at their sites, what they experience is an increase in cost due to overtime. So if we go to the next slide, I'll explain how we can avoid some of that. First and foremost, to avoid those increased costs, uh, we would encourage you to reach out to your ASC as soon as possible. You know, get with your, your service contractor and ask them, you know, what exactly do you have to do at each and every one of your sites to get upgraded to four core EMV? This is an important step one to understand the permitting, but also in understanding, you know, what, uh, what's your, what type of equipment do you need and how, what's the lead time on that equipment as well. That takes us to step two here, ordering your equipment early. The key is you got to lock your installation date in as soon as possible, and you want to be outside that six month window running up to the date. So that's roughly March of next year. So what we would encourage is get with your ASC as soon as possible so you can have those conversations, get your equipment on order, and get your site scheduled for an upgrade prior to March of 2020. Again, that's when the costs will start to creep up based on what we've seen in, in the last two major upgrade cycles that have occurred. Russ, next slide, please.
And from a lessons learned perspective, there's another element here in terms of training. Um, there is a, a wonderful amount of uh, messaging that gets displayed on the dispenser screens from the uh, point of sale systems that are driving these uh, transactions for EMV, which can be very helpful to a user, but it does require that those consumers that are coming to your sites actually read the screens. And we know from uh, experience that you know folks typically don't look at the screens often enough, especially in this key uh, changeover when they need to uh, use an EMV transaction as opposed to a MagStripe transaction. So what we would encourage you to do is make sure your staff is fully trained. Uh, make sure that once you've converted over to do four core EMV that your staff has used an EMV card at your site and they've bought gas and they, they know what that experience is like. Then they can help other folks that come to your site as well. And then ask them to look for customers that seem to be struggling at the forecourt, that there are messages coming up on the POS that somebody canceled a transaction. That might be an indicator that they need some additional help. I think the thing that we've seen that's been the biggest help is when retailers have, have uh, taken the step of using an EMV ambassador. And that could be somebody from, uh, from the store, some buddies that you've, uh, that you've brought in from other sites, but effectively it's someone who's very familiar with the EMV process and they can assist customers right there on your forecourt during that first, say, five to six days after you've converted to forecourt EMV transactions. Do want to make sure that everyone's mindful, though, that um, they're you know, of safety um, concerns for the forecourt, and if you take that approach, make sure you've got your, your folks uh, vested up with bright, uh, bright orange or yellow safety vests. And now I'll turn it back over to Dan, who will take you through Invenco's EMV solution. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> Go ahead with the first slide, Russ. So AMV offers an array of retrofit kit EMV solutions for nearly every pump that's available in the U.S. market. Each one of those solutions uh, includes the barcode reader and NFC contact, contactless as standard. Um, and there's really two product solutions, the G6 all-in-one, which is a uh, basically a single box with everything you need to do EMV payments. Um, and you can see the list of dispensers there that it's available for. And then we have the modular solution, which really fits into those ATM style solutions, which includes the option of eight inch, 12 inch and 15 inch color touch pins. Next slide. From a purchasing solutions perspective, oh, sorry, it's going went too fast. Uh, in the network solutions, we offer the Invenco Link, which is a high-speed uh, two-wire network solution. Basically, allows you to use the wires that are in the ground and convert those to a high-speed TCP/IP network, and includes AES encryption on the wire, uh, just to make sure you have that added uh, layer of security. Next slide. From a purchasing perspective, uh, you have the ab the ability to buy an EMV retrofit as you would normally do today. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, outdoor retrofit solutions available for each dispenser in the market, as I covered before, and screen options and service models to fit your business. So that's sort of the traditional, I want to buy the equipment and own it. A second solution we basically offer is basically EMV pay at pump as a service. Uh, for this solution, you pay a small upfront installation fee, and then you pay a small fee per terminal per month. So basically, you're you're paying for EMV as a service rather than buying the equipment outright. So in that solution, all service and warranty is included on a four-year term. Next slide. So we kind of understand that retailers consider EMV almost a tax on their business. Uh, so our eco ecosystem allows for applications to be deployed to those terminals that allow you to do things like media advertising, sell things inside the store, that could be food service offerings or other merchandise, or gamification on your forecourts in order to enhance your loyalty offerings, making it more fun, or even personalization of the transaction experience. So all of these apps are sort of an ecosystem developed by customers, third parties, or in them to themselves to run on the terminals. Next slide. And finally, to offer, as I talked about before, EMV often require, requires that there are software updates, kernel updates. We have a cloud service solution that allows an array of services that allow that to happen for the EMV devices, but also offer some of these enhanced offerings for third-party media integration, prompt management of the device, mobile payment enablement, 
uh, as well as other services uh, that are available to enhance the investment that you've made. Now I'm gonna turn this back over to Russ uh, from Dover Fueling Systems, and he's gonna talk about their EMD solutions. Okay, I'll just, thanks Dan, just spend a couple of minutes on, um, on weighing options for EMD upgrades. Uh, similarly, we've got the EMD uh, retrofits in the terms of bolt-on terminals or component kits for just about every dispenser manufacturer in the market for the last 10 years. Uh, we'd recommend as a business, if your dispensers are in the eight year range of age or older, that you may consider uh, a full dispenser replacement. You're going to get not only full EMV capabilities in a new dispenser, but new hydraulics, new warranty, uh, new skin, new look. Uh, so there's just some additional benefits that come along with that approach. If you're set on doing an upgrade, uh, we've got the T7 solution, which is a bolt-on terminal that can fit uh, our Vista products, the Gabarco Advantage, Encore 300s, and 500s. Um, in addition to that, the, if you don't, you're not looking for a bolt-on, it's something that integrates um, into your existing bezel. We've got retrofit kits for components to go uh, into two Vistas and three Vistas and turn that into it's a full bezel upgrade, uh, which basically turns it into a new payment terminal. Uh, if you've got an Ovation fuel dispenser on your forecourt, depending on its age, it may have uh, varying components in terms of EMV readiness. You might have uh, a current payment board, but not the right card reader that you need. So we've got an array of kits uh, that can upgrade your components for your Ovation dispensers, regardless of their age. All of these options come with uh, wireless solutions as an option, uh, and most of them come with uh, contactless EMV as another option. Now, I think that's important to mention just because we're seeing upwards of 90% of kits and dispensers move these days with contactless as well, since that seems to be where the market's headed after contact EMV. Uh, another kit variation that we have, we call it the eSIM kit. This is a component kit for the Encore 500, uh, 500S and 700S. This involves replacement of the center terminal with uh, a new bezel and re uh, replacement components. All the other existing screens uh, and, and push to start buttons and, and unit price displays on the existing uh, dispenser are used. This comes also with a 12 inch touchscreen option as well. Moving on to connectivity, um, if, if obviously, you know, if you've got CAT 5 or 6 cable on your forecourt or you have the capability to run that, um, you know, standard Ethernet switch in the dispenser will get you by. In most cases, that's just impossible or too, way too costly to do. So we have both wired and wireless solutions that can give you that TCP connectivity that you need, not only for EMV, but if you're trying to do additional technologies like media on the forecourt as well. And lastly, I'll just briefly mention. Uh, from a cloud services perspective, iSense is really our primarily re uh, remote monitoring and management solution. Uh, it allows us to aggregate all kinds of data coming from the dispenser uh, presented in a, a web interface, so a dashboard, if you will. Uh, this works for a single site or multiple sites. Uh, the key factor here, I think, for most smaller businesses that are upgrading to EMV, uh, one of the requirements that all level one and two merchants have for, for EMV is to do an annual um, or actually it's for PCI, but if you do an annual PCI self-assessment of your uh, PCI-ready hardware that's inside your dispensers, <clears throat> this can be done manually, uh, but the iSense tool actually gives you the capability to do um, an asset management report, which makes that annual assessment really simple. Um, so I'll end there, and I'll hand it back over to Dan Whitkipper. He's going to go through the Gilbarco solutions for you guys. Great. Thanks, Russ. So we'll start off on, on this uh, particular slide talking about the migration checklist. And you don't have to jot all this down. Uh, I'll give you a link here at the end of the, the slide where you can, or end of the presentation where you can pick this up as well. Just know that we've got a checklist for you if you've got uh, Encore 700 dispensers or if you've got a dispenser that was an advantage, Encore 300, 500, or even the S as well. Looking at some of those options, we can go to the next slide, Russ. Looking at some of those retrofit kit options, you see those on the right-hand side. Uh, similarly, going back to 1990, the Advantage dispenser, we can provide a retrofit kit all the way up through uh, present uh, dispensers that have been manufactured. If uh, kit's not uh, something you want to go with, obviously we've got the Cabarco 700S as well, and uh, th that is shipping today. It's fully uh, EMV ready with uh, EMV hybrid card reader as well. Russ, we can go on to the next slide. So as we've been talking through the uh, the connectivity, which is a key component to getting to uh, four core EMV, we have an option here for FlexPay Connect version two. Uh, that first option there um, effectively is 
uh, installing the version two of FlexPay Connect, it wraps that, uh, that two wire that's in the ground today and turns it into a high speed cable. As mentioned earlier, uh, we also have a solution uh, if you want to go straight with CAT 5E or CAT 6, that's perfectly acceptable. Just realize there's a, a limitation of 300 feet in terms of length uh, if you choose that option. Additionally, our passport point of sale has been four court EMV enabled now for a couple of years on most networks. Uh, talk to your local Gabarco AFC and or distributor about getting a software update to support that point of sale solution or to quote a new system if desired. Next slide, Russ. From a cloud services perspective, one of the, the benefits of getting to high speed at the forecourt is now we can do some really neat things with the dispenser. And our Inside 360 solution is our cloud-based offer for retailers like yourselves to enhance the consumer experience at the site, to optimize profits, and reduce the maintenance costs that you experience. So we'd highly encourage folks to take a look at uh, this solution um, as you are also doing your forecourt EMV upgrades. Next slide, Russ. And as I promised, we've got an EMV migration guide on our website. You can find that here at this link. And then the products we just discussed as well, they're also at the links below. At this point, I'm gonna turn it back over to Gray for questions and answers. Hi, everybody. That was a great walkthrough. Uh, a lot of information in the, uh, in the deck and that was presented. Um, I have uh, a couple of questions. The um, one that I had as we were going through the skimmers and shimmers, um, because it reminded me of that even though Europe has gone through EMV uh, upgrades, um, you still have a risk of even going to an ATM and, and uh, having a, a shimmer take your mag stripe card uh, data. Um, I'm hearing and getting questions from people about these Bluetooth or these, these wireless detectors. Um, I was wondering if anybody could comment on whether they have uh, any efficacy. Um, these are third-party, mount, mount, <clears throat> mount them on your phone uh, type of detectors that will see if you have a uh, wirelessly connected uh, skimmer. Anybody have any opinions on that? I spoke with, uh, this is Russ, I spoke with a, a Secret Service agent uh, recently in one of the presentations that we did for uh, Petroleum Marketer Association. Uh, and they said those will marginally work. They do have some ability to pick up um, uh, Bluetooth networks, but most of the guys who are more savvy with this type of technology, um, they won't actually be actively broadcasting the network. Um, so what you actually need, there are devices available out there. I, maybe one of the other guys remembers what they're called, um, but they're the kind of um, network detection devices that law enforcement agencies have used that are actually scanning for Bluetooth frequencies, not just looking for active Bluetooth networks in the area. Uh, and those are actually more adept at, at finding um, skimmers that are using that kind of technology. Okay. Another question. Um, I know that EMV does not, end, uh, does not add end-to-end -end encryption, but do any or all of these solutions provide an encryption option? I think all of us do. Uh, Dan or, or Dan, you want to speak to that? Yeah, is it, on the Gabarco side, we uh, we also offer an end-to-end, point-to-point -point encryption solution as well. Yeah, that's true for Invenco as well. We have a plug-in technology that allows us to support a variety of P2PE implementations. Same for Wayne. Uh, it's a basically an application, additional application that's installed with your payment solution that enables point-to-point -point with your host network. There you go. So another question that came up with is, um, why does it take a permit to upgrade your your four? Um, does, it, does it take a permit to upgrade your four core controller and your I guess your four core equipment to EMV? Great, I'll take that one since I had that uh, section on lessons learned. So it may not. So it really depends on the type of work you're having done at the site. If you are breaking concrete to uh, you know install new conduit so you can pull cable you're gonna get into a permit at that point in time. So it really just depends yeah. on, and there's some nuances depending on the, the locales, uh, the, the more of the, I'll say the, uh, the districts around LA seem to have some non-standard rules, if you will, for permitting. Got it. Yeah, so I think the answer is there are solutions in the marketplace that don't require permitting. 
So really, it's a. I think then the the advice is scope out what your work is going to do, and then run it by the the local authorities to see what you need if you need to pull permits at all. Exactly. Um, another question. Uh, let's see. Very small window to read from. Um, what percent of the U.S. stations are ready for EMV? I'm going to take that one um, because uh, Connexus has done a, a pretty comprehensive survey, uh, not only getting the, the pent-up liability shift, but uh, last July going into August, Connexus also surveyed just over 24,000 locations on preparedness. And, and so this is midsummer data. But as, as of that time, just over 40% of the sites uh, believed that they were going to be EMV compliant. Um, by the deadline. Uh, Connexus plans on doing an update to that uh, survey uh, that's going to just solely focus, uh, unlike the survey we did in the summer where we talked about indoor, we also talked about contact lists and so on. We're going to do a, a quick survey uh, towards the end of Q1 to see where we stand uh, at that point uh, as far as readiness and preparedness to upgrade. But um, you know, clearly, we do not have uh, the majority of the, the retailer community uh, as of the end of this year, saying that they're going to be ready for EMB uh, liability shift. And get on the move. So uh, another question that came up, um, this is an interesting one. I've heard a lot about EMV, uh, but what is going to happen with credit card fees once EMV is installed? And I believe the, um, I believe that the, uh, the question asker is wondering if there's going to be any type of uh, fee relief um, in return for the reduction of, of fraud. Um, I think I'll take that one on as well. Um, some, com some countries, um, like the UK, they actually incented retailers to install EMV through a small uh, reduction in the interchange fee. Um, I have not heard of any such actions here in the United States. Um, and that, in fact, the majority of the, of the retail ecosystem is, is already EMV compliant in the absence of any type of fee relief. So I don't think that we can uh, expect that that's going to happen. Um, Another question uh, for you guys: Have you heard anything about uh, the the uh, the death of the mag strike? Because we've, um, as we've, as you pointed out in your presentation, um, these guys are still going to be going after the track one, track two data, um, and until that goes away, we've got a vulnerability. So, has anybody heard any type of uh, indication as to when mag strike data is going to be uh, taken off the card permanently? I have um, this is, yeah, I, I haven't either. That question's come up in, in other similar webinars and presentations, uh, and I've heard no definitive timeline uh, of when that's going to happen. I, I think just talking on the side with representatives from Visa, it could be five to ten years before we see match strikes completely gone from hybrid card. My last question. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, the other the other thing that I've seen um, in other countries, because it kind of wraps up the last two questions together, is that as fewer and fewer MagStripe cards are actually being processed, the cost of managing each one of those cards goes up for the acquiring institutions. So you kind of got to watch out because there is the possibility that they will leverage that as a way to increase fees on MagStripe transactions. Uh, the other thing is that over time, that cost becomes so high that those acquirers will be incented to actually talk about or actually to implement what you're talking about which is getting rid of mag stripe altogether hmm. I'll, I'll add on top of that that um, there are still loyalty cards out there that predominantly function off of mag stripe technology but we are starting to see some large uh, merchants uh, mostly in the hypermarket segment begin to go to loyalty on chip as well so that that we're in the beginning of that conversion yeah and along those lines uh, you know, Connexus um, has been working quite a bit on PAR, which is a, is a data in the clear uh, augmentation of the chip so that a lot of that loyalty and a lot of the fleet applications, as an example, can ride along with a chip card 
um, and it doesn't necessarily need to be um, in an encrypted or a changeable form. So uh, I think PAR is going to step up and replace the need for those those mag stripe solutions for loyalty as well. I agree. And my only touch point was about three years ago talking to a Visa representative and 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 a Mastercard representative, and they both said that they have at quote unquote no plans whatsoever to get rid of mag stripe. Um, so. It could be a five to 10 year horizon, I think, as, as Dan has pointed out. Um, another question, will my AFC know how to handle the networking upgrade or is that a third party? I think the the uh, implication is, is that the networking upgrade sounds really, really complicated while installing a, a new terminal in the dispenser head um, is pretty straightforward for an AFC. What's, what's your experience and, and what kind of training are you folks giving to the AFC channel? Yeah, great, this is Dan with GoBarco, and, and we've um, we've taken our ASCs through a full gamut of training on the four core solution for FlexPay 4 um, or FlexPay Connect 2 for a, a FlexPay 4 terminal, and then depending on the POS solution inside, uh, they'll know how to engage with that POS solution as well. So this is Dan yeah, this is Russell. Russell. What I can say is that is that. Uh, those ASCs who are familiar with doing an implementation of a distribution box can generally handle these networking upgrades. You stole my thunder, Dan. That's what I was going to say. Our guys have been trained as well. You know, one of the biggest pieces of this is just getting the IP addresses aligned since each dispenser uh, fueling point now has to act as, a, as an IP address on the site, and that's a big piece of it. So these guys have been trained on on this type of network management. So. <clears throat> Uh, any other questions? Because we've pretty much gone through all the, the questions that we have. Um, hey, I can, I can think of one that needs to be addressed. There you go. Um, there's been there's been some discussion about whether going going straight to P2PE and not doing EMV is a, is a way to get out of this issue. Uh, and I think it's important that we talk about the fact that. You know, in last week's presentation, we saw that 90% of the fraud was actually counterfeit fraud. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the data was stolen from the fuel location. It could be stolen from anywhere. So P2PE really doesn't help you in that situation where somebody has white cards, where they've gotten the data from somewhere else, uh, and the card can still process. EMV is really right. your, your last realm of protection to make sure that counterfeit fraud is handled. My read on the on the point to point encryption is that it's really it's really eliminating that that threat vector of attaching something to the cabling out of the back of the reader and reading data in the clear. Right. So forcing getting the data skimmers. in order to create counterfeit broads. Yeah. Right. Forcing the skimmer to the front. Yeah. I'll I'll add to that, Dan, just to expand on what you said that you know you can implement P2PE on a site, but it also doesn't absolve you of the implications of the liability ship. You know, you Absolutely. still be on the hook for any fraudulent activity and chargebacks if you don't have an EMB capable terminal. Yeah. Uh, here's another question that came in. Um, is UL certification important when selecting an EMB retrofit? This is Russ from yeah, I, would say uh, I'll, I'll, I would say all of our products. Um, from Invenco to Wayne to um, uh, Gabarpo, they're all UL certified. That's one of the first things that we take care of on anything that has to go inside Absolutely. of the dispensers. Absolutely. Okay. And I think we have, oh, hold on, I've got another one that just came in. Uh, with current fleet cards that are not branded MasterCard and Visa, will they need to be chip based? Do you see fleet cards upgrading to chip based and away from MagStripe? These are non branded Visa MasterCards. Um, yeah, well, again, where I've, I've seen, uh, I'm actually just talking about fleet on chip. We actually um, are, are working with several um, large entities, uh, customers for a fleet uh, implementation of EMV. Um, so, you know, it's out there. Um, I don't know how widespread it is at this point compared to, you know, normal retail merchant activity, but it's being done and we have a solution, Dover has a solution available um, on the market. So, 
I don't know if that answers the question. Okay. Nope. I think that that I think that's the um, that's one of the the big issues. I, I know that when I've talked to Pilot uh, in the past about it, um, their their commercial side of their business, um, they've mentioned that that uh, some of the the non Visa Mastercard branded fleet organizations are looking at mobile um, replacement so that they're there's it, they see it eliminating a trip to the fuel desk, um, but on the consumer side, I, I had not heard whether people were moving away into a, a chip environment. So that's good good insight. Yeah, I know one of the big um, hurdles for for Wayne was um, an EMV approved, PCI approved alphanumeric pin pad, and we have that solution on the market now. Uh, I don't know Dan or Dan, you guys can I speak to that at all from your businesses. Yeah, absolutely. This is yeah, Dan Wickemper with Gabarco. We um, just recently launched uh, March of last year a, a full alphanumeric keypad as well, uh, EMV com compatible, BCI5 compliant. And, and that's put in the Wicca. We provide a similar PCI capability through our touchscreen. And that's to put in the alphanumeric data entry that you need for traditional fleet programs, correct? Yes. Correct. Yep. Okay. Well, we've reached the end of our questions. Are there any other last comments uh, from the panelists? Um, we can move to the resource page. Great. So this is uh, Dan Whitkemper with Cabarco. I think I just want everyone to to really take seriously that the date's not moving. October first is going to uh, twenty twenty is going to come, and um, we, we've got to get prepared for that. And I think uh, what I would encourage is folks take a look at what can they do to be ready earlier than later. Totally agree. We have not heard any indication uh, at EMVCO, at U.S. Payments, any of the <clears throat> any of the uh, uh, venues where we participate in this in this upgrade. Um, we've heard no indication from any of the card brands that this is even a remote possibility. Uh, the other thing I'd like people to remember, um, you know, that 400 million escalating to 450 million dollars. Um, Sounds like a pretty unbelievable number, but I think that we've walked through how that's going to happen uh, in the form of skid tanks. We've gotten confirmation that um, we are attracting global thieves to our market because at the end of the day, we are the single largest industry in the last remaining major market that has not gone to EMV. Um, our industry does routinely 10% of the car transactions in a given year. And I think uh, we'd be foolish to think that we are not going to attract people from all over the world to come in and try to exploit that that um, that problem. So um, I think it's time for us to take it seriously. It's not going to get pushed off again. Uh, it is going to be a big number. Uh, we can argue over how big the number is, but it will be a big number. And uh, I don't want to be that last 10% of the stores that has upgraded the EMV because we're going to see, just like with skimmers, we will see these consolidate to those those stores that have not taken the steps to protect themselves, and we can get into the situation where I can't afford not to, I can't I can no longer afford to upgrade because my chargebacks are so so high, um, and I can't afford to be in the fuel business because my my chargebacks are so high. So I think that's just the dangerous uh, vice that we may be getting into. I'm going to leave us here with some uh, resource pages um, that we have at Connectus. Um, we're always adding this, so please go back. These are publicly available. Please go back to the Connexus resource pages, and um, we'll be linking to uh, things as they come along and as we, we learn. Uh, Russ, we go to the next page. And, of course, here's the Connexus website, uh, a way to contact uh, the entire staff at, at uh, Connexus. Our LinkedIn profile, uh, we'll be posting a lot of updates as far as um, uh, EMV, but also just technology trends and cool stuff that's happening out there. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter. And so with that, um, I'm going to, uh, Russ, you'll take us to the obligatory legal disclaimer page. I'm going to wrap up the uh, uh, this presentation with thanking Dan, Dan and Russ for uh, putting together a really um, informative uh, PowerPoint and uh, presentation as to what the risks are and what people can do. And again, I would enjoin any of you, just please go out and if you uh, are using one of these uh, vendors or you want to contact all of these vendors, um, please use the connection, contact these guys. They'd love to answer any questions that you have. Okay. 
And so with that, I'd like to bring this uh, to a close. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. Thanks for everyone's time. Thank you.